Welcome to Science Minds again. Uh, I'm Andy Dacopoulos, your host, and today we're very happy to be joined by Sally Rogers. So welcome, Sally. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Definitely. So we'll kind of cover a broad spectrum of uh, topics and, and aspects of kind of your life and career, but I always sort of like to just jump off the bat to hear just a little bit about who you are outside of science and outside of research, and I'd love to kind of hear about some of your hobbies, some of your interests, who you are um, when you take, you know, leave the science world. And well, I kind of think I'm the same person in all places because, you know, you carry the important parts of you wherever you are. So I have a lot of interest. It's one of the things that's always been, um, you know, um, a fun part of professional life is to balance, uh, to be able to be all parts of yourself when you have a demanding career. But I have a family, I have daughters, I have a granddaughter. Uh, with each of my two daughters, I got a major grant, like the same month. So I had this experience of balancing parenthood and administering large grants with large staff, like from the very beginning. And my kids grew up always knowing what I did and being part of it at times. And um, they both ended up being nannies for children with autism and be knowing families with children with autism and being part of, you know, befriending those families. So they were always quite comfortable in the field of developmental disabilities because of what I did. And yeah. I always felt lucky to have had those things happen together because it makes you figure out how to live your life in ways that allows you to be mostly completely there for your children and then go to work and be mostly completely there for work mm -hmm. and um, that was always important to me so my husband and I had rules at home about I mean not rigid because he wasn't a rigid guy and I'm not a rigid person but like if you need to do work go to the office don't do it here so the kids know if you're here you're available mm -hmm. fortunately it was before cell phones and all of that so there weren't the distractions that there are now but we had some pretty clear boundaries about that, so you could be present. I have a lot of hobbies. I'm um, a musician, I do music, I hike, I love outdoor life, I love kayaking and traveling and walking and gardening and um, various, I'm trying to think of the others. I, I love to read. I read, I always have two or three books going. and. So I have a varied life. Like, yeah, yeah, that's great. One, um, I always try to catch this and pick up on um, art because this, that's kind of been a theme that's been running through my discussions with a lot of the scientists here is this connection between art and research and science. And I just heard you're kind of talking about music and mm -hmm. playing music. And I'd, be, I'd love to hear your perspective on how you may see those to things related or not? It's an interesting question. You know, people have talked about that a lot, and it comes up in the science, mostly as correlational studies, though. And there's so much socioeconomic um, influence in that that I don't know how much of that is really um, brain makeup as opposed to early exposures in families that value both academics mm -hmm. and art. Um, my family, my parents were somewhat academic. My dad was a, both a professor and a musician, okay. and he was a child of musicians. Um, my grandfather not formally trained, my grandmother formally trained, you know, way back when. So that was always part of the family, and I continued that with my children as well. They did, they were, they're skilled string players. Uh, we did music from the time they were preschoolers, so there's another part of parenting, you know, <laughs> that you're making room for uh -huh. in a busy life. And um, so I also, I collect art. I don't, I'm not gifted like Rondi is in mm -hmm. so many different expressions of art, but I really appreciate it. And I was very influenced by a mentor of mine around um, really looking, thinking that you, you can bring these things home. They can be part of your everyday life and your home. and 
that was a nice, one of the many things I got from her. She was also my piano teacher. Okay. But uh, that was a way of living that I appreciate from her architecture. I learned a lot about architecture from her. Yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of whole brain, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Talking about whole brain activities. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, that's great. Um, so kind of moving into your career a little bit, um, you know, you've done some really great talks where you've sort of outlined sort of how you kind of came up into the field and some of the mentors and experiences that you've had um, that kind of shaped you. But I'd love to hear a little bit more about maybe some kind of cherished memories that you have as kind of an early researcher or as a graduate student that kind of stick out to you as either kind of formative or um, just something that kind of you, mm. you kept with you uh, throughout your career? Well, okay, so if I go back to undergrad and graduate times, um, I was always interested in autism from teenage years on because of an article that I read. I was always interested in autism and I was always familiar with developmental disabilities. Uh, you've heard me say probably before, I grew up in a small town um, before there were the laws for special education, so children with disabilities were either lived at home or went to institutions, and in a small town they tended to live at home and just be part of their families, and so I knew them and was friends with them, their families, their brothers and sisters. It was not um, unusual for me. It wasn't something my life was separate from. It was every day a friend down the street with cerebral palsy, a boyfriend with a little brother with Down syndrome. Um, so I was always interested, and then this family with a child with cerebral palsy really opened up. Um, there were books in their house about cerebral palsy and asked me to come and be, befriend uh, their daughter when I was a teenager, when she would come home from the institution or private school. And I'd, so I'd spend time with her and just, you know, play cards and do games and we'd go places. And so I was introduced to her therapists and the materials in their home. So I was interested in that. And then autism. Of course, uh, when I was in high school, I read about autism and I was fascinated by it because I did have this experience with other children with developmental disabilities, intellectual disability, and the children in the article sounded different. And so, it was just interesting. So, an ex an, uh, repeating experience that I had in undergrad and graduate school was that I had big interest in meeting children with autism and learning about them and experiencing them and being with them at a time when nobody else that I came about was actually doing that. So the professor in undergrad, whom I said I wanted to do an autism project, what, um, under, in his class, he said, well, you know, I've not done that work, but I think I can find you an entrance through an institution. So then he opened that up to me and the people at the institution who kind of opened those doors said, well, nobody here is doing any of that, but you're welcome to um, engage. And I mean, it was crazy. Just <laughs> let, it, let somebody in with no supervision, no mentoring. But um, that my professor at school did want to hear about it. And then the same thing surprisingly happened in grad school. Now he's in a program in developmental disabilities and taking courses in autism and intellectual disabilities. And my main professor was in intellectual disability, so he had developed some interventions that use play in a variety of ways. But he'd never done it with autism. But I found a place to work with children with autism to work my way through grad school, the institution. And um, I wanted to, we were supposed to be doing work for his play therapy method. And I said, well, I'd like to do it at the institution with some kids with autism. He said, well, I've never done that, but I'm happy to listen to you. And then also the professor who was teaching the autism course hadn't really done treatment. So, you know, it was this process of people listening and saying, well, that sounds reasonable or it sounds like you're on the right track, but never having the expertise from somebody I talked to who knew more than me about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. It took me really a long time to find that. And uh, it was lovely as a, young as a young professional, a young professor moving into autism research and autism treatment to finally, as I was getting grants, to become part of 
NIH and Department of Ed uh, faculties where there were other people, a few of us, doing preschool intervention projects. So, so that was the beginning of having colleagues and having people welcome me into Lovas, welcome me into his clinic, the TEACH program welcome me into their preschool, uh, Laura Schreiben welcomed me into her PRT program at, uh, US, at U UCSD. So that was lovely because then that really gave you an opportunity to see what people are doing and what of this kind of enhances what I'm arguing and what I know and what, what works, what doesn't work. And so those were nice times. And then of course my, my colleagues in my programs, the, the staff, the teams, they were all people with um, already professional career speech therapy, occupational therapy, early childhood special education, pediatrics, um, psychiatry, neurology. So they all had points, uh, points of information about autism to bring to the table. So it was a very, uh, very rich time of pooling ideas from a lot of people who were interested in what we were doing, but really they had the same experience as I had. They'd not been taught that because it was before the time that autism was a household word plastered on the uh, web and the poster boards as you drive through town and um, you know it was at that time a rare disability and children were not in the mainstream and the word was not in the mainstream of public life. Mm -hmm. Yeah that's awesome. It's really interesting I mean just how things have shifted over time. Um, one thing that you mentioned that um, you know something that I really admire about you um, is the way that you, in the talks that I've seen, the way that you talk about your collaborators and other researchers, mm -hmm. um, what I've noticed is you really take time to talk about what makes them unique and special and what brings sort of what contribution they're making to the field. I don't know how intentional that is, but I've noticed it's a little bit different than other researchers who I've heard and seen talk about this person said this and here's their results and this is out of this lab and this is their results. It, there's, a, there's a certain personability and relationship that I feel like is kind of embedded in the way that you talk about others in the field. I'm just wondering like how does, how do you sort of collaborate? Like does that embed into your collaborations? How do you sort of, how have you maintained these relationships amongst, you know, the highest level researchers in the field over the years? And what do you think are like the qualities that have helped you to do that? I mean, it, it kind of, it's a two-way street. So sometimes you're at a conference, right? And you hear somebody give a talk, like Liz Bates. I heard Liz Bates give a talk. I knew who she was because she was in Colorado when I was, but I didn't really know her as a, per as a person. And then I heard her give this incredible talk, and I'd never heard anyone present the way she presented. She presented a lot like Steve Jobs when he was talking about uh, his, you know, the, the new iPhone or those things. <laughs> and I was absolutely floored by what, how she presented. And so then I, I read almost everything that I could get my hands on, and her work was so influential to me, and I'd heard her talk, and I'd been in a couple of meetings with her, and I knew other people who knew her, and it was, a really, it was very important for me to have a sense of her. Unfortunately, she um, died way too early, but a lot of her work is online, and so that was an example of seeing somebody and then following up, and I've done that you know, when somebody captures me like that, and I, there's always questions, you know, you have questions after they've talked, and so, you know, now you email them when, uh, back, back in the old days, you lined up after the talk and you stayed in line and you asked questions, or you looked for them in the meeting and I said, do you have a second? And so it was interesting to me, and I always wanted to hear their story. Um, sometimes like Damasio, Antonio Damasio has had an incredible influence on my thinking. I think he's a brilliant person. And my, my friend Bruce Pennington, friend and colleague and co, 
uh, scientist in many projects, he knew de Maggio. He, he was the first one to point that out to me. And so I ended up corresponding to him at some point and just saying, I, I don't know that you have, I want you to know what an influence you've had on me, and especially his book, Unearned Subjectivity. I thought that was a profound book. And I wrote to him, and then we invited him to come out here to give a lecture, and he couldn't do that, but I keep saying, I'm gonna, before too much longer, I've gotta drive down there and sit in his office. Um, because I want him to know that. And when the imitation work was going on and the mirror neurons in Italy, I was in Italy, and I was going there to do some work, and so I wrote to, oh, I'm gonna blank on everybody's name in those circles. But in Parma, the main mirror, mirror neuron people were in Parma, and I wrote and said, I'm, can I come and talk to you? And he wrote back, sure, you can come and talk to me. So he had no idea in the world who I was, you know, and I just like, okay, who's this? The way you do if somebody from another country asks to come and talk to you. I'm sure he set aside 20 or 30 minutes. And so I started to talk to him about my work in autism and the imitation theory that um, Bruce and I developed and the, the incredible effect of focusing on imitation of the young children, how, what a key I think that is to intervention. I think it's a key to the, some of the difficulties and a key to the intervention. And so then, and, and I'd already read the mirror neuron work, so I was already mapping this into could this be uh, a piece of what's going on in the neuropsychology of autism or the neuroanatomy of autism. So as I'm opening up these ideas, then he's getting really interested. We ended up spending over two hours and <laughs> going through his lab and meeting everybody and corresponding afterwards and meeting each other and conferences uh, here and there but it was huge and you know he would send me papers and I would send him papers and I always was tracking his work in the group of his colleagues because I thought the work was brilliant yeah. so it's just it's just that of knowing that people a people love to talk about their work <laughs> B people love it when you have real questions and something to bring to it you know mm -hmm. that it's not just like oh you're you're the greatest person that ever gave a talk, just talk more to me. You know, they like an exchange. Yeah. And, um, and people are so generous. I think in general, people are very generous in, as a young person in helping people develop. And when, they're, um, when you're an older person, people are generous in terms of just wanting to share experiences. So it, it really broadens the work for me and um, you know, many of the people, fortunately, many of the people I know are people who have done these basic parts of science. Kathy Lord has been a friend for for so many decades, and Helen Tiger Flussberg, Marion Sigmund before she passed away. You know, there's the circle of us, Jerry Dawson. Go back 20 years, and we were the first set of grants in the Center of Grants for Autism. So that brought people together from every field in these small groups at the time when NIH really fostered those collegial relationships. And um, so we know what people do, we know what they're good at, we get their advice, we um, send grants, to, grant ideas for them to write to, we ask them to read, they ask us to read, there's all this support that goes on. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you know where your ideas come from, they're not just from you. So it's very important for me to represent the, the field of the, the science, the collective science, not just the Sally Rogers science, but mm -hmm. it, it's a collective process and whatever I'm bringing to the table, it's, it's so influenced by all of the work everyone else is doing and I want people in the audience to know that. Read Kathy Lord's paper on these things, it's critical. Read the outcomes of these other people, it's critical. Yeah. You can't form opinions if you don't know the breadth of the work, the people who disagree and the people who agree and the people you're building from and why you've selected those routes as opposed to other routes. So I assume my, all my audiences, and they include parents, they include autistic people, they include scientists, they include students. They're all there because they're hungry to learn. And it's important to share all the sources and all of the ways of thinking so that people's own cognition can do the same processing I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, you're an excellent teacher that way, of seeing the big picture and seeing and explaining how things fit together and Thank how you. history flows. 
mm -hmm. um, and how that kind of trajectory looks and how you fit into it too. I think that's yeah. it's a really great skill um, and you're excellent at it. Well, you know, it's storytelling. The human mind is built for stories. People take in from stories and all the great speakers are storytellers. And um, I'll give a, a class in the neurodevelopmental course this year mm -hmm. on preparing talks. And we'll work through this model of you start with a story and a story has an arc. And um, that's what makes a talk that people remember and take out, you know, take home. And there's always a conflict, you know, the conflict makes it interesting and the resolution of the conflict that's part of a story. Yeah. And then just using the visuals to, to highlight the points instead of words. Yeah. Um, so so there's, a re there's an art and a science to building a good talk. And I learned it myself. I learned it from people like Steve Jobs and Elizabeth Bates and the books that I have mm -hmm. uh, that I've collected over the years. The Zen of, of PowerPoint, that was a very important book to me. Okay. Uh, yeah, I learned so much of that, get the words off of the screen and tell a story, tell yeah. a story that has emotional um, uh, grasp to it. For sure, so, that's awesome. Yeah. This is fantastic, I'm really enjoying this. I have a couple more questions. Sure. I'd love to hear, looking back on your career, uh -huh. what, what advice would you give to your younger self? I wish I had sought out more scientists early on. Treatment science, in developmental disabilities was just not developed at the time in terms of the kind of treatment that I do. But there probably was more treatment science, not in infants and toddlers, but probably in child mental health, in adult mental health. Um, it would have been nice to have more rigorous science, science mentors early on in my career. I don't n think that's a problem now. I think it's just a matter of timing. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I was really, I was raised in my graduate program, my mentors, not to be a scientist, but to be an applied developmental re uh, clinician. Mm -hmm. So I was really kind of tutored to do the work in terms of working with families and children and adults. And there wasn't so much, there wasn't a scientific approach to treatment at that point. There just wasn't. It wasn't developed. And so, and then, so the jobs that I got early on were more about applied work. And it was me bringing in questions about science that added measures and started to pull things out and just wrote papers, you know, in my time as a clinician in these, these programs. Um, but I think early, like my first few projects, the one in Michigan would have been better informed if there had been some more rigorous scientists advising that. It just wasn't part, these weren't NIH grants, these were more applied grants, NI, uh, Department of Ed, Rehab, things like that. So it's evolved, but I wish I had been able to bring more science to the work early on. I always wish I knew more neuroscience and could have formed uh, better questions for my friends who were neuroscientists. I've been able to collaborate more with them around the neuroscience part of the interventions we were doing. We could do neuropsychology, and I think a lot of the, the measures that we used informed us about the neuropsychology of children, with young children with autism. But the neuroscience piece, I was always talking with Susan, and with Dave Hessel and David Amaral and different colleagues here about, is there a way to get to what's changing in these children's, um, more directly into their brain systems? And of course, Susan, I love Susan's pragmatic answer. She says, if you're changing behavior, you're changing brain function. They are not different. It's like, I know, but people separate those in their mind. They don't think of behaviors reflecting brain function, uh, and they don't respect that work in that way. They respect more hardcore brain science. But, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of levels to that. It's huge, it's expensive. We just couldn't do it. We couldn't figure it out in, our, um, in the time that we had here. Yeah. And I admire folks like Jerry Dawson, who can do that kind of work. Um, it takes a big lab and it takes a lot of know-how and 
Some people have it all, and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, well, one final kind of question, and this kind of segues into, into this last question, but what do you think is like special or exciting about doing science now at this point in history? Well, I can only talk about my own science now, yeah. right? Because I, I can't answer that from other uh, viewpoints, but it's an incredible time to be doing autism treatment work. There is so much developed now, and the methods are so much more developed, both the measurement, the behavioral measurement, the ability to use eye tracking and ways of monitoring um, cognitive processes in young children, in infants and toddlers, and these um, this very young group, which I think they're, they are the crucial, their work in the early years of autism is crucial to answering questions both about the nature of autism and about um, our ability to support development and learning in people with autism. And the way that developmental psychology has opened up the uh, our understanding of infant processes and toddler processes moving, you know, way uh, pre-verbally and being able to use what what do the what do the ba what can the babies and toddlers tell us? All the questions that you can answer about babies, you can answer about infants and toddlers with autism. And so the tools of that science are incredible, and I think, but there are. It's hard to wed those, and a developed tri treatment and intervention and a developed ability to bring those measures together. Um, people at the Mind Institute have those, uh, and it's, I guess, a matter of rallying forces and having the time to sit and talk. It doesn't come easily, the ideas and the crosstalk. And it's hard to find those kinds of collegial times. You know, at the beginning of the Mind Institute, I think I envisioned, naive as I was, that there would be times when that used to be a lunchroom and people, you know, there used to be really good food here. And we would, um, that people would sit around and talk about things and that there would be more talking time. Because that's where that kind of work can come from. When you're going across disciplines like that, you need open time and it's hard to come by. The group that, when I was in Colorado, the group there used to have a retreat every two years, and we were in the mountains. They took people out of town, and they took them out of kind of sophisticated, it was up in the mountains. There were, there, I doubt that there's good internet up there even now. Um, and half of each day was completely open, and the activities were hiking, uh, you know, one trail or hiking another trail or this kind of thing. Half of each of the structure times was unstructured discussion with the leaders who were brought in. And some of the best science I did there was stimulated by ideas from that retreat because we were all together, all these different disciplines, with stimulating uh, speakers, world-class speakers who could address uh, widely across disciplines. And then all this time, to talk and process, both with them and with our colleagues, what the implications were for our own science. And uh, I've always wished you could find a way to create that here. And it may just be that it doesn't fit in modern scientific times. Or, or maybe it does, and some, some people will find a way to do that. Even the Colorado group doesn't do those retreats anymore, but they yeah. still have their meetings. For and sure. they still have that kind of dialogue, where in their meetings, most of the time is devoted to discussion, mm -hmm. not presentation. And I think that's a really important part of setting up a meeting. When you want that kind of crosstalk, you've got to have the presentations be 10 minutes and the discussion time be 45. Yeah, for sure. And, and that can be done here, that can be done anywhere. Yeah, well, I think people are yearning for that. Mm -hmm. But it's, it is, it's finding the space and the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And prioritizing it. Yeah. Yeah, Definitely. and COVID didn't help. <laughs> it doesn't work so well in Zoom. No. It can, but not as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's a great place to, to end off with. It was so nice to talk with you. We really, really appreciate it. Welcome. So, thank Thanks you. for the opportunity. Definitely. 
The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.